Welcome to the Occult Rejects. In this episode, I got my man back with me. I'm always happy to have this guy on. I got the headless giant himself. And uh, co-hosting with me, I got the mad scientist, Lisa. What is going on? Thank you for coming on and co-hosting with me. Absolutely. Awesome. This should be, uh, an ex- uh, this should be an interesting show. One, I'm actually not all that well uh, knowledgeable about Edgar Casey. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was the fact of the first time I've heard of him, unfortunately. Came out of David Wilcox's mouth. And when he said that he was reincarnated of Edgar Casey, I kind of forgot, purposely forgot who both of them were <laughs> once I heard that. So, but he, uh, I think he's a very inf- influential man. Um, you know, he was a spiritualist in some ways. And uh, I think spiritualism is a very interesting topic in itself. So I think uh, between the three of us, we could probably have an interesting topic about Edgar Casey and maybe some of the ways he's influenced or how spiritualism has influenced society. Um, I guess real quick, just in case people don't know who you are yet, which they should. I mean, he's, you know, one of the occult rejects, in my opinion. We got the Headless Giant. Please let everybody know where they can find your own stuff and what you're about, sir. Thank you. So, um, Headless Giant, you can find my uh, podcast, my intermittent sporadic podcasting on uh, YouTube. If you look up the Headless Giant, you can also find it on X. I do a lot of posting there. Um, I'm also on Instagram if people want to check out a little bit of the artwork. So, um, today's topic of Edgar Casey goes into a lot of other avenues. And I think uh, covering the basics on Casey, talking about what his influence in his lifetime, and then how it sort of branches out is a very influential thing and and understanding the influence of him can actually apply to a lot of other different areas because the Edgar Casey foundation is still around today. And it's basically a holy site for a lot of spiritualist churches. Now there, there aren't very many left. You'd think there will, would be more of an interest with that, but the spiritualist church has basically stayed under the radar in this whole sort of conspiracy culture that's been going on. But they were hugely in- influential in the time of their prominence, especially among uh, presidents even. You know, Abraham Lincoln was into spiritualism. Uh, Mary Lincoln Todd, big spiritualist. So all of these sort of factors and how... Um, the methodology used by Edgar Casey was very much in the spiritualist tradition. And so having sort of that groundwork gives you one of the ways that he becomes very influential today. So even though there wasn't, you know, there's not a big focus and um, effort of the spiritualist community, at least not visibly, it's still there as an undercurrent. And so talking about Casey is, is really interesting when it comes to these undercurrents, especially when it comes to people like David Wilcox, like what is he trying to get legitimacy from? What is he trying to take out of it? And all the rest of that. So yeah. Lisa, did you, did you have uh, the basic details? I can go over, you know, the biography of Edgar Casey, but I'm sure you've got. The, the I, I will say, yeah, I got, I got some that um, the first time I heard about Edgar Casey sadly was on coast to coast. And they started talking about him and, you know, how he was clairvoyant and how he um, could predict what somebody had, like an ailment of some sort, and that if it was misdiagnosed, that he would give them the correct um, remedy or cure or treatment or something, and they would go back and it was alleviated or something. And from that, I had heard that he had also recommended certain types of diet, like eating of potato skins or something, and that it was helpful for proper food functioning immune system and we later find out that selenium is very high in potato skins and selenium is absolutely essential to immune function so all of a sudden you know they they kind of i i heard it for the first time and i was like wow this you know this is amazing and then you hear the other stuff and you're like oh wow i had no idea but that that for me was my introduction to edgar casey back in the day was the health aspect that he was um giving to his people that would come see him very interesting so my introduction to Casey was a little bit different. Uh, I had gone on vacation with a bunch of friends of mine down to Virginia Beach. And, you know, eventually, like, you know, we're hanging out on the beach and stuff. And they're like, why don't we go to the Edgar Casey Library? And I'm like, Edgar Casey, why is that familiar? And then, you know, I learned about it and I went to this library and I'm like, wow, 
this thing is huge and it's very influential, you know? And so I did more research into Edgar Casey, and, um, you know, uh, later on, I went to a spiritualist church as part of a, um, my anthropology degree, right? As, as part of that, it was, uh, ethnography. So I wanted to do an ethnography on the spiritualist community. It was very small and there's only like one or two, uh, spiritualist churches that I know of on the East coast. This one was in falls church, kind of close to Washington, DC, kind of an interesting site because, uh, a lot of people of prominence go through there. So the spiritualist movement in general is basically about uh, talking to spirits of loved ones that have passed on. And there's a whole methodology behind it. They have an entire clergy that uh, you can become a part of and then go through their program and understand the methodology of how they speak to the dead. And it's exactly like you see on the um, – those cable programs that have the uh, the psychics who speak to the dead and stuff like that. They don't talk about the fact that they're using spiritualist methodologies, but that's exactly where it comes from. So that's, I mean, that's basically, that's their the- theological program is what you're seeing on these shows. And so it gets debunked and rebunked and all the rest of this stuff. But Edgar Casey was in that milieu. He was the, they called him the sleeping prophet. Mm-hmm. So uh, he was... Let's see, he was born in uh, March of 1877, and he died in 1945. So there was a lot of changes going on in society during that amount of time. I mean, just huge earthquaking sort of changes. So um, he was born in uh, Kentucky, Christian County, Kentucky. His uh, parents were Carrie Elizabeth and uh, Leslie Burke. Casey, and they were farmers, parents of six children, right? Mm -hmm. And so he was brought up to church at age 10, where he became engrossed in the Bible. So this, this followed him all throughout his life. He was very engaged in the church. He was three times a week, he would always be going to church. He never wanted to sort of go against church doctrine. That was his family, you know, and that was his first love. And that's important to look at the rest of his life, because None of these things came through the church. He was not going to spiritualist churches. He was not engaged in any of that community, but he had a huge influence on it because of what ended up happening with him. So, um, you know, that time period when he was alive, I feel like that was like a, I mean, I'm sure there's always as many occultists around and really the number doesn't change, but I feel like there was a lot of prominent or well-known ones um, from that time period. A lot of them around World War II, which I find yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah, right. I well, I think that time period in occultism can be most accurately portrayed as being the dominance of the um, the Blavatskyite sort of influence, right? And so... Well, you know what you even well, got then, too, which even makes sense a little bit if you really think about it? I mean, you got Crowley in the Book of the Law. Again, that's another mm-hmm. channeling aspect if you're actually catching on when he's getting. Right. Yeah, so, and, and like, something you had mentioned before, I, I really do think, I mean, you took it back to Abraham Lincoln. I mean, obviously, this has been going on for a while, but I do feel like around World War II or a little bit earlier, you even did kind of feel like almost had a resurgence maybe of, like, spiritualism, and they're always, like, contacting these people from somewhere else and getting this knowledge. You had the Council of Nine, you have this guy. You had so many people that were supposedly contacting spirits right well the influences of the spiritualist church it definitely starts with christianity with the charismatic movement right so speaking in tongues and the rest of that stuff and then it started taking on uh native american influences right and so with the native american influences you also have you know shamanism and the speaking to the dead and these things were huge in that time period because they were witnessing a lot of strange phenomena associated with it. And so a lot of it was, you know, basically charlatans, but there were some that remain unexplainable to this day, phenomena associated with this kind of um, table tipping. That's one of the terms that's used. So basically it's a seance is sitting around a table, right? So the spiritualist church basically took those seances sitting around a table and they did it in a uh, church setting. 
So you would have people in the pews, you would have your, um, your speaker up front. He would start to channel this information from the dead loved ones and start to pick people out of the audience and start to read for them. Just like you see on those, uh, cable TV shows, right? That's, that's sort of the basis of how all of this stuff got started was they, they felt the movement of the spirit and then they would step back out of themselves and allow that other presence to speak through them. And that's sort of how Casey sort of comes about too, is, you know, he would go into a trance, right? I think he found it by, by sleeping and this, this voice would come through him. And so what he would do specifically was the work of a doctor. So he would be diagnosing people's problems as they would come to him. And then in that, you know, diagnosis, he would come up with uh, all sorts of different tr- treatments that turned out to be highly effective for these people. And he didn't know why or how he was never good in school. He wasn't highly trained as a doctor, you know, but this guy just sort of had this gift as being a really powerful medium. And so he had to find a way to support himself because he did not charge any of these right. patients who he was uh, basically curing of their ailments. He didn't charge anybody. So what he did instead was he had um, a, a focuser or a, a, a hypnotist, right? Take the channeled information about other topics and then write all that stuff down. So he's, most associated with his uh, channeling work on uh, Atlantis, right? Because that was a big focus of everybody's, you know, uh, ideas back then is like, what's going on with Atlantis? And so he would write books about Atlantis and what was going on back then, all from this channeled perspective, all of which, you know, had a, a big contradiction with Christianity, like, their worldviews of whatever he was channeling in Christian worldviews were not similar, but in his everyday life outside of these uh, channeled events, he was fully involved in Christianity. He just knew that what he was doing was helping people and he had to support it somehow because, you know, he didn't want to charge them. So, you know, why, why charge the poor and the sick when, you know, you're curing them. So he was really admirable in that regard. And he gets shit on by Christians today for being this sort of false prophet. But it's like, guys, he was more Christ-like than any of you guys attacking him. You yeah. know, he was actually curing the sick and helping people. I mean, as a matter of fact, what we were saying earlier is that he was saying that he would get these readings or he would get these channels, and if they didn't fall in line with his Christian beliefs, that he wouldn't promote them. And right. so there, and that he felt that if he were to charge, that all of a sudden that gift or that ability would not be as prolific as it was for him. Um, but in, in essence, he also, you know, talked about, it, aside from that, he talked about diet. He talked about doing other things that everybody's talking about now about being healthy and how it promotes, you know, this, this awareness, this consciousness awareness. And, and I don't know, to me, it's, it's nothing, you know, that unchristian what he was promoting, but. Well, as I've learned more, I think it was pre-Christian what he was doing. So before um, Christianity came about the way that they would do healing or, you know, doctor work, Mm-hmm. would be through a place called the Asclepian. Now, the Asclepian was a Greek temple that was dedicated to the god of healing called Asclepius, which we all know of as the snake wrapped around the staff today. It's it's one snake wrapped around a single pole, and the double snakes wrapped around that pole is called the Caduceus, right? And that's associated with Hermes. Mm-hmm. So in the 1930s, uh, early or late 1920s, early 1930s, the army adopted the hermetic uh, snakes, right? So you see this confusion start to happen because the army decides that they're going to uh, put that symbol on their patches, right, for the army medical corps. Unfortunately, that's the symbol of... Um, basically profit, right? So if you're talking about uh, consumerism and profit and all the rest of that stuff, that's hermetic, right? That would be the Hermes staff with the two snakes. The Asclepian staff is the staff with the single snake. And so in the 1920s and 30s, 
as you see the shift from, you know, naturopath, naturopathic uh, doctors over to this allopathic doctors, the shift occurs primarily in the symbolism as well with the army mistaking this caduceus symbol for the rod of Asclepius and putting that on all their patches. And then all of these hospitals do the same thing. It's funny because that symbol actually represents the, the path that they were taking, which was, you know, basically becoming uh, – profit whores for uh, the medical industry, <laughs> right? And so at that shift, you know, you've got the, the Rockefeller Foundation, Rockefeller Medicine, and all the rest of this stuff influencing that. But um, what, what would happen at the Asclepian in these ancient times is you would go there and sleep in the temple. This is where we get the term sleeping in from. Because what you were supposed to do is get visions in your dreams of the uh, the doctor Asclepius coming to you and telling you exactly what you needed to do to get better, and this was highly effective back then. So he wasn't just practicing, you know, a form of medicine that had been unexplored up until that time period. It was a form of medicine that had been practiced for thousands of years before Christianity. So it, instead well, even of when having he the shamans would do the same thing, you know, right. Native Americans and uh, Central Americans and all the way down. So it was it was not unheard of in that realm. Well, Sorry, I mean, I mean in terms of Western medicine, that shift occurred at around, uh, you know, 2000 years ago to start having a single source of authority on all things medicine. And it, right. it was no longer up to the patient for them to heal themselves. Now it was up to the doctor to do that sort of authoritative healing because he had, you know, the degrees and whatever. But the idea behind the Asclepian was you're there to get a vision from the gods. And so you would sleep on these cots and they would release snakes under these cots as you're, as you're sleeping, right? Because somehow the snakes transferred their ability to shed their skin over to you because that's what you're trying to do in this, uh, medical ceremonies you're trying to shed the old skin and move into something new and that's why you have the symbol of the snake on the staff is because it's the idea that you also have the ability to shed all the old stuff off of you and you know regrow something new and better and so the the symbol of the snake associated with medicine makes sense from that perspective but unless you've got that perspective you have no idea why there's a snake on a on a staff out there and you have no idea that it's related to these dream temples, right? Dream temples. It's not really talked about too much. But, you know, when it goes back to Jesus, like right outside of the place where um, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist was the Asclepian for that area. And so people would come there for these dream visions so that they could heal themselves and get better. And it's funny because, you know, Jesus is associated with being this doctor, Right. And so doctor and healing and, and it sort of transferred that focus. Well, maybe the church should be the one that is the ultimate authority over healing. And so in some ways, yes, Edgar Casey challenges the church's authority, but not in any way that he understood in terms of that historical focus, you know, mm -hmm. having that historical focus was not something he was even interested in. He was just interested in helping people. And in fact, so much so that Edgar Casey ultimately dies because these events where he was doing the channelings, they took a toll on his own health. And so he would have these skeptics coming from, you know, far and wide trying to test his abilities. And he wanted to help them out just to show them, look, what I'm doing is real and legitimate. And so he would keep doing it over and over again, not giving himself time to rest or to recuperate or to have, you know, the proper heal heal healing uh, himself. And in doing so, basically, he, he wore himself out and died because of it. Yeah. So all what things was, to keep in mind. One thing I was going to say is that even though we see this, this uh, monopolization of health with, you know, let's just say doctors and pharmaceutical industry, and we see this mo monopolization <laughs> of spirituality with the churches, you have these institutes, and I'll throw Esalen out there, that that are using some of the teachings and they don't seem like it on the surface, but uh, massage therapy was one that Edgar Casey promoted and Eslin does that UV 
therapy and light therapy is also part of that, which we covered a little bit in the morning chorus that we talked about how UV and you can see UV from the sun and that there is a lot more of a spectrum that you, of information that you can receive when you see the UV light. So that already is one that they use as well. But um, one that he promoted enormously was the interpretation of dreams or getting in touch with your dreams. And that's something that even uh, the Institute, uh, Eslon Institute has published enormously on is um, uh, dream interpretation and learning about the subconscious um, processes. You know, you know what's, what's really interesting is around the same time, the Kellogg's were also doing their own little thing, mm-hmm. kind of like on almost stuff like this at their yeah. little like cult getaway type place. I forgot the name of it. But yeah, they were doing like weird things there saying that it was you know good for you. Yeah. Right? No, it, mm-hmm. Well, looking back through the lens of allopathic medicine, all of this stuff seems incredibly sort of fringe, but even more so back then because they didn't have the uh, testing equipment to actually notice, hey, this, this, there's different qualities of light and these different qualities of light have different ways of influencing you. To them, light was light, you know? And so thinking that the light has some sort of magical quality immediately got put into the category of magic instead of science, right? And so right, right. not having these uh, the ability to measure this kind of stuff, put it on the outs with science, right? But, you know, as we learn more and more, Hey, you know, these guys were onto something and there's no real scientific explanation for how they could access that information. That's the key part is like, how were they accessing the information? And so, you know, especially when it comes to people like David Wilcox, what they're going to do is they're going to say, I have this magical access to this information because I'm, you know, reincarnated Edgar Casey and stuff like this. But it's like you look at their methodologies and it's not the same. You know, yeah. and once you break down the methodologies and you break down the results, you, you can actually see that there's a difference. But, you know, it takes a little bit of faith to actually go down that pathway to find out that there is a method to this this yeah. whole phenomena, you know, well, which totally contradicts the cornerstone. What Edgar Casey was trying to profess is that everyone has the ability to do this. You just have to engage and learn about yourself, learn about the dreamer was the main thing, right? That the dreams themselves, every character in the dream themselves is you, is a persona of you, is a, fr- is a fractal of you trying to give you a message or trying to teach you something, right? And yet you have these people that are, no, 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 only through me can you learn what the information is not yourself. And then you see another monopolization taking yep. being taken from Edgar Casey. Yeah. And that was one of the big um, reasons why spiritualism kind of fell off the map is because all of these different spiritualists leaders all tried that monopolization. They all look sort of towards the, the model of Christianity and how, you know, there's only one source for this truth. You have to come through us and it has to be this way. And they, they split over and over again. And it was nasty and it really did not reflect the methodologies that they were getting to that place. So, mm-hmm. You know, by that time, they were already under attack from, you know, the Rockefeller medicine and all the rest of this stuff. So Mm -hmm. unless they had sort of this united front of having a methodology that anybody could access, it it falls apart. And that kind of goes to the idea of charging money for healing, you know. So having these healers charge money, the natural result would be, well, you've got to come through me and you've got to pay me first. but. Again, that's not what Casey was doing, no. so he had a lot of success in that regard. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I would agree. And then you had Carl Jung around the same time period promoting alchemy through or spiritualism through alchemy or alchemy through spiritualism or that fraction of alchemy and pushing hard on that spiritualism. Um, and then you right. had Nazi occultism going on at the same time, the wrapping, the table wrapping as well. Um, so it was it was prime. Right. right. That time. People understood something was happening, and sometimes it was the most, uh, I guess, the least what you would think about, right? So, for instance, the, um, the what are they called? The, um, the socialists in England, right? The uh, Fabian Socialist Society, they got started 
through this occult circle. Like they were involved with the spiritualism and the founders of the Fabian Socialist Society were, you know, basically in a, a haunted house doing a table wrapping as they were coming up with the Fabian Socialist Society. And that, there you go, you know? And so these guys are the, the number one proponents of this sort of scientific materialism, right? Mm -hmm. But they got started in this whole you know, uh, spiritualist milieu and nobody makes that association, but it always sort of comes from this undercurrent of spirituality. And then it moves into how do we make money off of it? How do we, you know, how do we get the most material benefit from this? And for Fabian socialists, it was like, we can be the pinnacle of what people think of as scientific you know, and being the pinnacle of what people think of as scientific, like for instance, uh, Karl Marx, he called, you know, his pursuits like the scientific pursuit of history. And so his idea was, I am the most scientific, therefore my ideas go the furthest, right? And so this appeal to science coming out of the, the mystical practices has always sort of turned bad, always, always had that rotten tit to it. And, you know, it, it has changed. Like, I've seen a lot of paranormal researchers who are just far more open about everything they're doing instead of doing it all behind a curtain, you know? Having mm -hmm. that curtain there between you and your audience is the first indicator that you're being fooled, you know? Yes. Well, it's that moment that they want to separate themselves. They want to, or I guess, place themselves in another echelon, if you will than their followers or the people that are listening to them. And that is, well, again, going back to Edward Casey, that is one thing that he didn't believe in or that he wasn't promoting as well. Whereas you see all of these people who went into the monopolization of these factions, that's what they're doing. They're trying to separate themselves from the consumer and uh, make money and then have that curtain and not consider themselves equal to these people that they're trying to help, so to speak. Right. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I see the Edgar Casey Institute doing a lot of good work trying to develop that aspect of, you know, you are the person who can heal you best. And having that there is is far more important because I think um, you can't really monetize that. You know, that's that's the big shift in uh, perception that a lot of people need to come to is you're never going to be the healer of someone else. Their body has to accept that phenomenon. There's the phenomenon of voodoo death. I don't know if you've heard of this, where mm -hmm. like um, native peoples will believe that a witch doctor has placed a curse on them, so much so that their immune system and their bodily functions start shutting down. They believe so much that they are cursed, their bodies will shut down to the point of death. And on the other side of that, you've got the uh, placebo effect, right? Where we see people having miraculous things happening to them just because they're believing and they're feeling and they're experiencing that healing on a mental level before it ever, you know, manifests physically. Almost right? like so, psychosomatic. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. So all forms of healing has to take place in the body and mind of the patient before it can ever actually occur physically and uh you find it over and over again. unfortunately you know maybe there's more profit in keeping people mentally sick you know the more mentally sick they are the more they come back to your hospital the more you can be their one source of truth and healing for all time so yeah. they're the ultimate drug dealer working on the comeback right. but you know the thing is that one of the things that edgar casey also promoted is that he was pushing food to be thy medicine which is one of the cornerstones again of the hippocratic oath is do not harm and let food be thy medicine and right. he pushed that i thought he did i'm not I'm, by no means am i trying to you no, know that's whatever that's absolutely it, true yeah so and of course you can't i mean unless you you know consider food you know to be owned by the pharmaceutical industry but which it's starting to be but you know the thing is that it yeah that's how he promoted it well, there's so much potential for control coming through medicine that a lot of people didn't realize until, you know, the whole COVID thing hit. And it's like, mm -hmm. wow, this one aspect of my life can now dominate every other aspect, mm -hmm. you know? And I think 
a lot of people were going through that before the COVID era that they couldn't get other people to even understand. Like this medical industry is completely controlling and dominating my life simply because that I've listened to them and they have no idea what they're doing. And now I'm basically perpetually their victim because, you know, one pill leads to one uh, side effect and that side effect has to be dealt with with another another pill. And eventually, I mean, like we saw it unfolding in real time with this uh, the COVID regime, you know, we had, well, look, nothing is changing because you're being a bad person. Like we're still having the same infection rates because you are being bad and you're not putting on the, the mask. So we're, we're going to have to put on even more restrictions to get even more intrusive into your life because you're a bad person. And that's why we're having such a, a bad time with this. And, you know, I mean, people like Casey would just laugh at that kind of stuff because, you know, everything they're doing is to put, you know, the opposite of what healing is in the mind onto these people. They're putting sickness into the mind. I mean, we still see people walking around with masks on because they are mentally sick, you know, and nobody's trying to cure that. None of these doctors are even attempting to. No. And that's the thing that I find the most criminal is like, doctors, you need to get out there and help the people that you've damaged with this COVID crisis. And none of them even want to address it. That's a good point. Correct. Yeah. Well, once you're institutionalized, you're institutionalized, you know, right. and I think that's what happens. And they just. Well, you also have to admit it. that you were wrong. Right. Very true. The institution can never admit that it's wrong. Never. No. no. Not unless they can profit from it. So an apology right. or giving oh, yeah, something like that. Or fixing the problem or helping you you'd be showing you were wrong. Created a problem. Won't happen. Yeah. But, you know, even another thing, like most of the people that came to, came to Edgar Casey were people that were misdiagnosed. Right. That was a right. majority of his clientele in terms of seeking health um, uh, advice were people that were misdiagnosed. Right. And so that's another point of contention. Misdiagnosis is, uh, yeah, I mean, the medical establishment admits that misdiagnosis and mistreatment is probably around the third leading cause of death, right? So you've got heart disease, cancer, and then the third leading cause of death would be iatrogenic death, which is a uh, Greek word that means basically you got fucked by your doctor and he gave you the wrong pills, he gave you the wrong medication because he wasn't really paying attention, you know? I, I would argue that it's the first. Right. I would argue that it's the first, but you know, I yeah. mean, you add up all of the things that they've done to mess with your diet. I mean, look at margarine, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Margarine never did anything to improve the hearts of the people that it was supposed to help. Right. Cause yeah. margarine right. was introduced as like you know, heart disease is a major problem. We need to stop using animal fats and, and butter. We need to use margarine. And it did absolutely nothing to improve the situation when it came to heart disease. Still the number one leading cause of death. And all of the predictions that they made about, you know, margarine stopping this stuff, absolutely false. And it's one molecule away from being plastic. And they're, everybody's still using it because it's cheap. It's dirt cheap. And they and, understood and well, they can make with your with your um, example of margarine and, and tying it all back in, is it butter itself from grass-fed animals that – not just grass fed, but multi different types of grasses has enormous amount of bioavailable B vitamins and all of the other, um, what is it? Lipopolysaccharides and essential oils, as well as, um, the name escapes me, but you needed those for your diet in order to process and clean your body. And yet you're moving away from that. And again, going back to Edgar Casey, he's telling you, no, the natural food is what's going to cure you. And most right. of these grass-fed byproducts, such as milk, butter, and, and um, meat, help you to clean your body or keep it maintained and keep it healthy. So, right. yeah. And that, that sort of shift that's happening right there during his lifetime, you can see it best represented in the automat. I don't know if you guys have ever seen these automats before, but it, it was popular back in the uh, early 1900s. Basically, it was a place where you could put a couple of coins in a slot and then out pops the food, right? And so this is like the height of industrialization. You don't have to talk to anybody. It's a cafeteria where you never have to interact at all. You just pop in a couple of coins and out comes the food. Right. If you think about that, 
People think that milk comes from the grocery store. You know, they're convinced that, you know, maybe there are no cows involved in the production of milk, that it just comes from the grocery store. The food comes from the grocery store. This is not, it's not how it works, but that shift in focus away from like the natural way of, of going through the process of getting the food and understanding the supply chain to now having no attention paid to the supply chain whatsoever. You just go to the store, you pop in some coins and out comes your food, right? That sort of shift in focus really became clear during his lifetime. And I think, you know, having him at that point really hurt a lot of these, you know, medical industry, food, agri industry, and all the rest of this stuff that we're still sort of feeling to this day, like you're talking about, you hear in these interviews, all these different important contributions that never got any attention because he was on the outside of the industry. And on the outside of the industry means you get none of the focus. You get none of the attention. Right. It's like sheep, you know, we're all just being herded into the automat, plopping in our coins, getting back whatever the hell we get back. That's true. And I think we see a lot of that in the occult world too now. It's like we we see these people talking about, well, they're Christian and they have this perspective on Casey, so maybe we should listen to them. You're plopping in your attention coins into a person who's, you know, making these assumptions about this guy that they know practically nothing about, you know? And it's like, well, he was he was a false prophet because he said things that were outside the Bible. Dude. He wasn't in control of the things he was saying, and he was a three-time-a-week, you know, church attendee. He was trying to help people. Can you at least give him the benefit of the doubt there? Wait, he was a false prophet because he spoke outside of the Bible? Right. That's Every that's one of these they, motherfuckers the that are probably shitting on him do that every day. Were you kidding me? <laughs> but again, you got to lift yourself up and make yourself that monopoly. What it's the, the same f- process. Fuck you. Yo, that is the yeah. silliest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but, you know, the world is a lot bigger than what the people trying to close down these different areas are trying to tell you it is, you know? And I think Nephilim is a good example. Like, it's become sort of like a go-to phrase. Anytime you see anything weird online, it's like, that's Nephilim shit. It's like nobody ever thinks that maybe this was the perspective of a certain group that was opposed to all of the other groups around them. You know, like you were like your ancestors were all of the other groups around them. So they're when they're talking about the Nephilim and stuff, they're talking about you. You're the bad guy in those stories. So maybe back off a little bit and understand that maybe you're not the bad guy. Give yourself a break. Right. Because they were talking about you. And they were talking about cleansing you off of the land and getting rid of people who were taller than they were getting rid of people who were stronger than they were because you know, that's, that's basically how it operated back then is like, you didn't want to have tall, strong people surrounding your nation. You had to get rid of them any way you could. And so thinking about the Nephilim from that geopolitical perspective is far more useful than just saying, well, anything that's weird, that's Nephilim shit, you know, come on. Yeah. It's a, it's a hot word to just throw around nowadays. I've noticed do you think sure. the attack of Christian people against Casey can't, comes from, I think it was in the 40s, where you started to see a huge amount of like different denominations of Christian churches, different Catholic churches from around the world. You had a lot of Protestant followers, and I believe some of the, even the Asian religions were drawn to his teachings and were wanting to, to follow in that, that line of footsteps. Um, and so I think somebody, they had to, they want to maintain membership, right? They, they need those subscriptions. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think they need a very them. different sort of um, time period today as opposed to back then. Back then, Christianity was the establishment. So like the government, the, you know, politicians, the scientists, the medical researchers, all of that would be inside sort of the Christian milieu. Today, Christianity is on the outs from the establishment. It's like the establishment dropped their toy. I don't want to play with you anymore type of meme, right? Yeah. That's sort of where Christianity is. is they're kind of on the outs now. So right. in being on the outs, they feel like they have to reestablish some kind of legitimacy. And, and the way they do that is by going back to the Bible, right? Instead of looking at guys like Casey and saying, maybe I should take care of my health. They're going to be like, well, he, he wrote these books that disagree with me. So 
we're going to have to, you know, wipe those off the map because we've got the Bible and we don't need any other books. You know, we don't need to actually think too hard about that stuff. We've got our answer right here. Only, you know, that's how the, the biblical establishment was able to get rid of these characters to begin with is they said, we've got this book and anything he's saying is quackery. So, you know, it, it puts you right back in the same position over and over and over again. It's the same cycle from the beginning of Christianity is like, you've got this establishment, this legitimacy, and then all of a sudden all the stuff that happened before it are gone. And then your health goes down and then your political situation gets out of hand. And then you go back to the book that got you in that place to begin with. And then you start the cycle over again. So we've got to expand these horizons a little bit. You know? you know, and and most of most of these religions, they talk about the temple, the body being the temple, and to take care of right. the temple. But they never tell you how to take care of the temple. This is the moment that somebody actually took that and expanded upon it, and showed you, and told you, and gave you advice on how to take care of the temple. And yet, n- nobody really gravitates towards that. That that was actually a great contribution of expounding that part of the Bible, according to Gacy, because most of he, what he said, he claimed was of a, of a Christian basis. Right. So, and, you know, in, in his everyday life, Casey was not a very well-spoken man. He was, he was pretty uneducated, right? He did not complete high school. He was, you know, he started out, his family were farmers and they were not, you know, too sophisticated, but you know, within this whole sleeping prophet, sleeping doctor scenario, this was a high level of sophistication this guy never had. So unless these skeptics are arguing with this spirit that's talking through him, there's really no, there's really no feedback here. You know, the guy's not going to understand what you're talking about. So having that sort of perspective, it, he was talking to the common people. He wasn't talking to the establishment, you know? That's that's sort of where this spiritual vision was taking him. Was It was going back to the common people. It was not meant to be debated in, you know, theological seminaries. This was, this was simple stuff for simple people. And, mm-hmm. and you know, as oftentimes... It, the, the most powerful medicine, like Ayurvedic medicine, is, is simple medicine for simple people. It's not about any of these philosophical discussions. And again, the philosophical discussions then get monopolized by the biggest sophists and repeat yeah. the cycle again, you know? And they end up hurting themselves by thinking that the experts have all the answers when it's simple medicine for simple people. I mean, mm-hmm. energetically how our, our bodies respond to certain inputs is very simple. You know, yeah. you fill your mind up and you fill your body up with the wrong kind of stuff. It's going to produce bad results. It's just, it's so simple, you know, and once you can clean that stuff out and take really good perspective on the situation you're in, that's when things start to get better, you know? Agreed. And so Agreed. Which was another that, tenant of his was magnetism. Now that you bring that up. Right. Right. Animal magnetism was huge back then. This was the start of hypnotism and and formalization of hypnosis and having that um, ability to, because again, it was called animal magnetism because of stuff like um, the ability to hypnotize a rooster by drawing a line in front of its nose. Right. So having the ability to create that kind of same effect in people was, you know, considered to be, frightening and and nefarious and all the rest of the stuff but at the same time this is how you heal you you've got to come into this place of acceptance shown a different perspective on your situation and then working through all of the negative consequences that have built up because of it you know right And, you know, it's no different, like even in like with the study of immunology, if your body is already compromised, trying to fight something off, it's not going to be at the ready because it's too busy trying to fight something off. But if if your mind is clouded and your mind is not clear, it's not going to be at the ready to perceive things, to interpret things, to realize things um, because it's preoccupied trying to take care of something else. And what do we see today? The epidemic of inf- inflammatory chemicals everywhere. No, it no. clouds the mind, clouds the body. Everything no. becomes 
you know, unclear. Unclear, cloudy, and just miserable. Something affecting I had, spirituality, affecting everything. Yeah. Something Sorry, I, had, I had wondered about uh, maybe his technique with, uh, I guess, healing people. Because I think maybe me and you, Lisa, might have mentioned it recently in discussion about something uh, with uh, looking in people's eyes and being able to diagnose Iridology. issues. Iridology. Yeah, I wonder if, like, he was kind of hip to that in a sense. Who knows? And I would just... Especially, like, if you're getting into a person who's into occultism. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they're in it for a long enough time, and I would just think eventually you're going to start getting into your eyes and your brain. You know what I'm saying? I think so. I think because of the symbolism that he was uh, towards the end, right, he was heavy into some of the symbolism. And then if everything was being relayed to him in a dream state, he's he's not taking in anything from his eyes. He's now projecting out right? Because you have your eyes closed. Nothing is coming in. It's all coming You're out. You're looking at the projection inside your head instead of out with exactly. your eyes open. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. So I... Well, I all this came I, about because of his illness, right? Because he had such bad laryngitis, he couldn't work because his dad later on opened up a insurance business, right? Because, you know, he, he learned the business from being a farmer and understanding the insurance uh, around that. And so... He wanted to hire Edgar Casey, his son, to be part of this business, and Edgar Casey couldn't do it because he had such bad laryngitis, he couldn't speak. And this is where he discovered that he had this ability because he could only speak while he was asleep, right? And so that that changed everything for him, and then he started to do that for other people. It was like it was so clear and obvious how things needed to change simply because he could not do it while he was awake, you know? And so once he had that cure for himself, then he was able to cure others. Was he Catholic or Christian? Or like, what was uh, he? I think he was. Christian? I could look up the denomination real quick. Because I, uh, I mean, I know it would be two different, I guess, technical denominations. I mean, Christianity and Catholicism. But I do wonder if maybe he was influenced by older Catholics or older people that were taking Catholicism and mixing it with, like, Kabbalistic ideas or you know, occultism because in the uh, 1500s to like the early 1600s, you had a, a few. He was hands. Protestant. It was the disciples of Christ denomination. Oh. So I could just see how you could maybe be influenced by some older stuff and still have like a Catholic, a Catholic or Christian view. You know, I oh, can yeah, see it definitely. even being very deeper for that person because of maybe taking other people uh, who mix the both. And wrote about well, within within the Christian tradition, there's the laying on of hands, which is common practice in uh, praying for healing. Right. And so you'll have the patient. They don't call him a patient for obvious reasons. They don't want to get sued by the medical establishment. But you've got the patient and then you've got all of the people praying for them, laying on hands as they're saying their prayers. And so they'll go sort of around in a, a circle praying for that person and praying for their needs. And so. You know, that's a technique, but they don't really see it as sort of um, spiritual healing as much as like, you know, we're praying for this person. So it's sort of like all of these things that originated through, you know, the religious practice of, of getting into this, this clear state of mind and, you know, processing the energy through the body. It's sort of been lost throughout history. Uh, there, there's still a lot of that within uh, the deliverance ministries of a lot of um, uh, charismatic denominations, but it, it sort of stops. There's boundaries between these churches based off of their theological statements, right? So deliverance ministries is far more uh, in regards to demons possessing a person. So they've got a, a, a litany of questions that they ask a person, and basically they find where these uh, demons are, uh, you know, attacking certain parts of their body, which is causing health ailments. And so through the prayer and uh, meditations that they prescribe, they're able to get rid of a lot of ailments associated with a negative energy being stuck in that body that they call demons, right? And so those demons take on a personality, whether or not it happened before or after the deliverance is sort of up for a debate because, you know, a lot of times... How do you know what voice is talking to you in your head? So if you've got negative self-talk going on in your head, how do you know that's not a demon? Mm. Is there any way to know that? I have often know? thought that. Yeah. 
That's something true. to that extent. I mean, even Crowley even kind of suggests that the Goetia is just all in your mind. Right. Uh, to an extent. You know, the didn't Casey also suffer um, an injury to his um, tailbone, which is considered like the root chakra? And I think that's how, how he like began that he could cure himself and that he could cure other people. Is that my mistake in that with somebody else? Um, I'm not seeing that. Um, but no, it was a, it was a stage hypnotist that originally sort of introduced him to this whole thing. And the hypnotist basically brought this, this spirit out of him that allowed the guy to talk because, you know, he was desperate. He couldn't get, find anybody to cure this laryngitis that wouldn't go away. But it was almost like this entity was possessing his throat. And so he couldn't really speak as long as he was, you know, actively using his will and not letting this other thing talk, you know? So there's a lot of this entity talk there, but you know, the idea of spiritual entity seems to be more frightening than it could be hopeful, right? The idea that there are spiritual entities that could inhabit your body is like a first indicator that there's probably life after this existence, you know? So for anybody scared of demons, maybe you will become one one day by having that negative reinforcement over and over again of thinking you're possessed by demons, right? Why wouldn't you possess somebody else if that's where your mind's at all the time? Mm-hmm. You know, and having the the ability to shift focus from thinking about these demons possessing you to, well, you know, this means that the soul is more than just the body. You know, that's that's an important shift to focus. But, you know, unless you get to that point, it all becomes frightening in sort of a self-perpetuating way. Self-perpetuation fear. Yeah. Talking about that earlier, even uh, Teresa recorded a show today, and she kind of got into that topic too. Very interesting yeah. stuff with that. And that's that's really what the nocebo effect is. So you've got the placebo effect, right? Which is uh, everyone knows it's where you get better, sort of spontaneously, as you're you're given a sugar pill, and then the nocebo effect eventually leads to that voodoo death scenario, right? Where you're so convinced that you can't get better that you're cursed that you end up your body ends up failing you completely. You know? And you know what's really funny is how, like, not to get off, you know, kind of what we're saying, but this does go back a little bit to Edgar Casey in a sense, is that, uh, in, in, in some way, is that we were kind of talking about, like, these, you know, these prophecies that are going on now about, like, what's happening with April 8th. I said, just like back with, you know, 2012, you had somebody just like, David Wilcox again, going back to Edgar Casey in a sense, swore something happened then, and right. he upgraded to 5D or G or whatever the fuck they call it, five <laughs> fifth density. And it's like, yo, you have to make something up because your bullshit story never happened, and right. people like will still want to believe this guy. So it's like people who are even lying about these prophecies now. I guarantee you a few of them will save their ass by still making up something happened that you can't see or be proven just so they still have you captivated. Well, on some level, it's like, well, I was just warning people. I didn't know. Right. No, but there'll be some people I'm sure that will like keep going with some sick, twisted shit. Not even saying people we know. Some random fucking channel on Rumble or YouTube. You know what I'm saying? Like... That unfortunately has like 200,000 people listening to it also. (laughs) Right. Like instantly people just flock to this stuff. And I think there's a form of of messianism is like you go towards the guy making the biggest noise. And if you're making the biggest noise, you're going to get the most people watching you. Right. And some people are shameless in that regard, but others actually genuinely believe that they're helping people by sort of bringing that nocebo into their lives. I think at the same time, we can all sort of see kind of the the downward progression that is sort of leading up to something. And I think energetically, everybody has that in their minds anyway. I mean, mm-hmm. a friend of mine was talking to me about Biden versus Trump, right? And if you take that perspective and then you juxtapose it with like a Greek perspective on this election, they would say that the society is already dead because you've got two corpses going up against one another. One's turning 80 and the other one's like 84. So it's like the energy, there's no youth coming into this thing, you know? So it's, it's sort of, it's on that 
regressive cycle again and again and again. Like it should be Don Jr. versus, you know, Hunter Biden, right? But these, <laughs> these two people are completely unelectable. So I like you know, this. I like that. I like that way to look at it. That'd be some sick piece of art. Or some sick sculpture of trying to put those two up as uh, the gods really? competing for us. <laughs> On some level, this energetic display is leading up to something, and we all sort of feel it. So there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with recognizing that. On an energetic level, we're sort of doomed. We've got these two corpses that we're propping up and saying, these are our leaders. There's no youthfulness. There's no uh, energetic nature to them they're they're on the way down they're on their way out and i think people pick up on that on a very subconscious level i mean it's are kind they of really in charge of anything it's kind of allegorical to the state of america in a in a whole is that you the it's it's sad you know i mean after caesar was um assassinated you know they tried to maintain you know the empire but they were pretty much dancing on the corpse already of what was and, and it almost has that same feel. And right. now that you put it this way with two corpses, you know, running and we're, these are the people we've been left with to elect, it almost has that same flavor. Right. But I think, you know, if you take that representation to the next level, these are two idea sets mm -hmm. that have kind of run out of time. And that's exactly where it's at. It's like, we have to figure out what's actually happening. And so we've got to take these idea sets that have been in competition with each other for so many years and finally put them up against each other in this final battle. Well, the, the final battle is just two old men who can barely, you know, get themselves out of bed in the morning, slapping in a slap fight. So, you know, at a certain point, you've got to move on. You've got to bring that new energy in. That's and, like... That's like yeah, a, I see any of that happening. iPad Go 3 when you got Biden and Putin fighting on top of the house. Right. And I was saying, I was even brought that up today earlier. I was like, you know, it's kind of funny how technically if you want to look at which way, depending on how you want to look at this Ukraine situation, you do technically kind of have Biden fighting Putin just with proxies. <laughs> you know? Right. It's true. <laughs> This is very true. Yeah, 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 because we're, like, talking about random things that have uh, come out. And so, that. obviously, at a point like this, people turn to messianism because they want that new energy. They want that returning energy. They want the stuff that made them vital to begin with. Well, the, you, know, you know what I think they love about Trump is, like, this whole rising phoenix from the ashes type deal, too. Right, right. There's a lot of narrative at work here. And I think narrative is, is really what it all comes down to because— we can't think without narrative. We can't speak without narrative. And, you know, the idea that these things are happening outside of narrative is completely preposterous. It's all part of a story, you know? And when it comes to science, you have to believe this stuff is happening outside of a narrative. But that's just not the case, you know? Everything is part of this narrative. So, you know... I think uh, the experts really don't have anything to say anymore because they're part of these two corpses that are fighting. They don't really, they've run out of energy as well. The expert class is just done, you know? Who wants to believe any of this crap that comes out of CNN and all the rest of these people who represent that expert class? You've got to go outside of the establishment to find any kind of vitality anymore. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. You know, something I wanted to bring up earlier... Um, maybe we'll talk a little bit about this and then maybe I might have to wrap it up, unfortunately. Be just a little bit over an hour this episode. Um, and I hate to go back to the Kellogg's again. It's just with the whole spiritualism thing, too. Um, you know, you were talking about like how food was very important to uh, this man as well. I mean, that was like a, a big, I would say they took it to the extreme to like, you know, just a bland fucking salt pepper diet. That's it. Uh, you know, the Kellogg's had their, they were very big on food. And for some reason, that one guy who's big on uh, mastication, which is, I think, chewing, right? To where right. he even thought there was like a certain amount of like chews that should be done before you swallowed for your body to absorb it. And the reason I keep bringing them up is because their niece does tie to the Urantia book. So again, you're getting people who are almost like, Kind of round in the same area of thinking, maybe a little bit of extremes than Edgar Casey was, and it also kind of into contacting spirits or channeling. Just I find that very interesting now looking at it since we've been talking about Edgar Casey. Well, I think it's it's the perspective of the the Kellogg's that you had to uh, severely control 
every aspect of what you did to get the right results out. Very scientific, right? Whereas, you know, Casey would be like, well, you've got to take in the right things so that you can produce the right things. And so... Doesn't this also sound like if you were to construct a ritual? Right. You're going to have everything is matching correctly down to the colors you're using, what kind of candles you're using, what hour, what day. I mean, you almost start getting like that just to do a ritual of magic. Right. It's, but it you know, what is that a reflection of? That's that's a reflection of maybe not everything is good going into it because you have to control everything in the process. And so it doesn't really leave any room. But, you know, that's... That's sort of emblematic of the uh, laboratory conditions. The the Kellogg people were very big on laboratory conditions. Oh, yeah. We have to have everything sterilized. Everything must be dead and sterile. And that's that's sort of how. So he was he was experimenting with um, what was it uh, spring water and all the rest of this stuff, and steam baths and all the rest stuff that you know turned out to be pretty good but at the same time it's like he was he's throwing in all of these grains that basically turn you into a, a mind numb zombie when all of what your diet is is just these grains you know which is perfect for his system you know because you have to have everything so regimented and so controlled that the only way you could experience it and still get some sort of joy or pleasure out of it is if you are a brain numb zombie, you know, and he was also big on circumcision, which shouldn't be a big surprise either. Every aspect of the body must be maintained in complete control. Yo, that guy yeah. circumcised himself with no painkiller. Right? And I literally, it was, I think on his wedding night or around there. So he wouldn't have sex with his wife as well. Unbelievable. Like, Yo, who cuts wow. that off? Just and don't get married. I mean, God, you don't have to. But, you know, one of the things with the Kellogg Foundation that you all mentioned is that they support, they currently still, but I think since the 90s, they support a multi-billion dollar grant for florid, floridization of water. And they started it in Central America, Central and the upper part of South America. Um, and then now, obviously, you know, in the Americas as a whole. Right. And I'm talking about forward. compromisation of the brain. Look at corn. I mean, Kellogg's yeah. never said anything about GMO corn. They've never said everything has to be controlled. And that, that whole corn idea is we can make the perfect food for humans out of this plant that we have domesticated to such a degree, you know, and it's like maybe corn isn't supposed to be the staple of everyone's diet, but it's in absolutely everything. Find me something that doesn't have corn syrup in it. I, I dare you. <laughs> no, that is right. Yeah, no. That's a really that's... good point. That is in a, so much shit. Right. So much stuff. Right. So all of these energetic aspects have a reflection in reality. Like going back to the army, changing the symbol of Asclepius to the, you know, the rod of commerce, you know, the rod of Hermes. And that's not what it is at all, you know, but since that time period, it's been that focus of nothing but commerce when it comes to medicine. So I, I don't know if they did it on purpose, but the end result is the same, you know? Uh, another thing I was uh, thinking about, and then and then we'll wrap it up with this cool question, I guess, kind of for both of you. Well, one, I think I could probably speak for all of us, but I mean, really speaking for myself, uh, just for the listeners, I don't entertain every story that is supposedly channeled or was like, you know, I don't think all of them are real. Um, with that said, I have one, but I do think there are some that, you know, there is something there for sure, for sure. Um, but I have wondered, obviously, like due to maybe people who are still in the know, but are just trying to do like a smoke and mirrors type deal and make money. You know, I have offered wondered, like even the situation with Albertus Magnus and the 1200s having an Android, you know, could that really have just been them understanding the manipulation of like Mercury and magnetism or like heat to where it's just going to move things anyway. You know, or was there just a child inside something, you know, could, could, or something I have often thought about because of looking into uh, a guy that I've had on the show, uh, Leon, um, I forgot his uh, whole name, whatever. And he's into cloud busting and that's real easy to actually do. I mean, it's not even costly to do. Could you have, like, back in the day, understood this stuff to an extent and, like, 
Who's to say you don't have something in your living room set up or the lights are out, you only got a candle, and you have something that's like plugged in, you know, maybe a little bucket of water somewhere else where the wires are running to, and you're literally creating mist or cloud busting in your living room. And motherfuckers think you're, you know, you're the fucking man now. And it's like, no, right. I just actually understand science you don't know anything about. Right. And there are levels of science that we haven't reached yet. And back in Edgar Casey's day, they hadn't reached those levels of science to even understand UV radiation. So it's like we're constantly looking at things from our current perspective. We can. I think of, that's wrong. I think if we look yeah, at our current yeah. perspective, we're screwed up. Because like I've even said before, there's books. I actually want to find the book because I want to buy it. Because it wasn't by like anybody like well-known famous, but it was still enough. But like it's a 1600s book detailed, more fucking detailed than I think I've come across on the eye and the brain. Drawings. How did they do that then? Right. That's, I don't see, since when we covered the series on the eyeball, I couldn't find stuff that detailed that this person was drawing in this book. That's amazing to me. How, how was that done 400 years ago? I, we can't go by what we think is the technology or understanding today. Because then we'll never see what the fuck they were doing in the past. My opinion. Right. Do you Absolutely. think that information existed in the ether? Yes. I think everybody can contact it if they, if they want to, in a sense. I do, too. Well, that's another why, That's another reason why I think sometimes some, some stuff can jump or show up at different times or places. Because the, it's up there somewhere. You just have to tap into it, I think. Well, most of the Christian mystics that we covered and most of the older occultists that we covered, they believed in that. They believed that that all that information exists on that thread. Michael Meyer talked about that, on that constant thread of knowledge, and that when society kind of downgrades themselves or gets all messed up, someone somewhere can tap into that thread and bring us all back by revealing that constant thread of knowledge that exists in the ether. Sometimes I think that's where, like, kind of these religious stories ended up really... It was just somebody who had that experience, and then they made it as, like, this authoritative <laughs> whatever, you know? Right. Well, here's a, here's a good uh, way of sort of solidifying it. So as we live our lives on this mortal coil, we're sort of surfing a wave of causality that is thousands of years old, right? <laughs> And so instead of trying to change the wave, what we should be trying to do right. is to create our own wave thousands of years in the future, you know, trying to get people into the consciousness of that place where we can access this type of knowledge, this type of information to help help ourselves in that sort of same trajectory, you know. And so a guy I listened to, Chance Garden, he talks about how Spiritual healing is actually the only revolutionary act you can take, right? Because everything else has a cost. But when you're talking about healing somebody spiritually, it doesn't have a cost. And once you've helped that person fix themselves, they're different from that point on that politics cannot do, right? So when you think about it from that perspective, things start to come into focus a little bit more. And it's like, well, what I am doing is making a difference. What I am thinking, what I am putting out there is having an impact. And once we see things from that, that perspective, all of this talk about money and billionaires and materialism, it just sort of fades away because, you know, that's part of it, the old wave that's crashing now that we see with Biden and Trump. It's, it's just sort of the old perspective and it's falling apart you know i mean it has no choice but to fall apart. apart it's built out of you know twigs so yeah. maybe let's try to get that causality wave flowing in the other direction because if we start it small now it could build up over time you know that's awesome awesome i love that yes i, I think we can uh, we can leave it there my man well said as as usual headless uh, let everybody know where they can uh, find your stuff one more time. Again, if you look up Headless Giant on uh, Twitter, you can find me there or X. Uh, you can find a couple of my interviews. I did a great interview with Robbie Marks about right. the uh, Virgil and his impact on the United States and human farming in general. So That's right. I was even thinking, yo, there was another topic I wanted to get you on for. And I forgot. I wanted to get you and Robbie on to talk about that. I think that would be fun. 
There's still so much material when it comes to Virgil. There's so much. Oh, yeah. And nobody's talking about that. Awesome. Nobody. Well, we'll get you on. We'll uh, talk about that soon. Uh, definitely go check out his links. I highly suggest to go check out his spaces when he's doing them. Uh, very uh, entertaining or educational, actually. It's just, it's actually just a cool place to hang out. <laughs> Tell you the truth. If you ain't got nothing to do, go hang out over there, man. You'll definitely have fun. Um, Lisa. Future is Ancient Friday nights. That's right. Just check out that hashtag, Future is Ancient. You'll find us. And the mad scientist, thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Do you want to let everybody know where uh, where they can find you? Oh, is that Did your you train? Over the train? Oh, yeah. yeah, don't worry about it. We're I'll plug you. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was theme music for a second. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah she's coming out on like, the carpet for like WWF. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, Solis, Lisa, or Lisa Solis. At one of them Instagram and one of them's Twitter. So I always get confused which one's which. I just type out her name when I try to find her. Uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with her, um, thank you both, uh, very much again for, uh, jumping on. Uh, it was a great talk and, uh, hopefully, uh, the three of us or whatever, will be, uh, chatting it up again soon. Um, I know normally would go live on YouTube. I'm just like letting people know. Um, a lot of times when I go live on YouTube, listen, I do appreciate all the people showing up. I love it. It's just sometimes it gets a little bit too distracting. So, um, today I was just not going to go live at all. And then I was like, you know what? I could go live on Facebook uh, Rumble and Twitter, and not have to worry about messages screwing me up. And with these, it'd be 66 people watching right now. So obviously, that did actually pretty good. So um, I may do these uh, in between more often. Uh, so you know, keep an eye out for that on Twitter. And I will tag the person that I'm doing it with. I tagged uh, Headless. So uh, yeah, keep an eye out on Twitter and Facebook for maybe a little bit more lives than normal. And uh, thank you guys again. And until the next one, everybody be well. Later.